Welcome to Fellowship. If you are a first time guest, thanks for coming. Please fill out the communication card from the seat in front of you and turn it into the black communication box in the back or to a volunteer at the welcome counter. We pray that you will be blessed by worshiping with us. Mm -mm. I got some good news. Wednesday night meals will resume at the 301 campus for the first week of August and continue each week from 5 to 6 p.m. This is a great opportunity to connect with others while enjoying a delicious meal together. We want to invite you to spend some time with our pastor and his wife as they share more about how fellowship can help you connect in worship, grow in community, and live on mission. Join them for Connecting to Fellowship on Sunday, August 21st during the 11 o'clock worship service. You can find out more information and register at fellowship301.org or on the Church Center app. Hey kids and parents, our Wednesday night Awana ministry will be kicking off in just a few weeks on August 17th. Awana is a time where kids can gather with friends in a fun and energetic environment to learn about God and life lessons from the Bible. You can get more information and register at fellowship301.org or on the Church Center app. Join us on August 14th for Emerge Mission Sunday as we continue our focus on God's global work locally, in the U.S., and around the world. There will be morning worship services at both campuses, special activities for the kids, celebration of the mission trips taken, and inspiring preaching by a guest speaker. To make this day even more special, we will have one combined evening service at 6 p.m. at the 301 campus with a meal following. Now, I, you know you don't want to miss that. So plan to be here and plan to be challenged to live on mission. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Bible study and another soggy Wednesday. And if you're watching from home, it's a good thing you're at home because you wouldn't have a place to sit if you came tonight. And uh, we have a lot of folks uh, tonight over at um, Sefner as well. We have our second week of vacation Bible school that's going on over there. Uh, my wife called me this afternoon to remind me, hey, I'm not bringing you any food tonight because I'm not coming to the church, so make sure you eat. And so I was able to get a couple of tacos. Thank you, Pastor Dave. But anyway, so it's been exciting two weeks of vacation Bible school here in the middle of the summer. And uh, we want to go ahead and be uh, praying for that tonight. Also, I wanted to mention uh, one of the announcements I wanted to highlight was the Emerge Mission Sunday coming up on August 14th. We do our annual missions conference every year in February. And what a powerful week that was and just, uh, just a wonderful um, attendance, support for missions, really representation of our global outreach. And if you'll remember, one of those Sunday nights we had one of our speakers was Matt um, Walters from Tampa Bay Muslim Outreach and just did a tremendous job. On August 14th, he will be speaking in both surfaces in the morning and also in the evening. And so we're looking forward um, to him being with us. And so normally, you know, we, we reserve Sunday nights for special events through the year, and this is one of those. And so it's kind of a mid-year tune-up toward missions and focus and keep that in front of us. We had a couple of teams that were out this past month in Guatemala and then also in Hungary. And then a couple of young ladies in our church were with a team that just got back from Costa Rica. And I think we have another group leaving in October, I believe, or September for New York City. So what we're going to do that day, we'll be hearing from those teams and just really a missions focus and tune up. So it'll be a great, great uh, weekend and always, always well attended. And so uh, we look forward to that. And so get that on your calendar and so you don't plan something else. And that is on um, August 14th. Tonight in our Bible study, we're going to be over in Psalm 91, so I want you to go over there. We're in a series right now on 1 Corinthians, but I knew with, with everyone out, a lot going on, we'll kick that back off next week when the meals begin. Was anyone in here Sunday morning when that announcement went off about meals resuming? It's like everyone woke up in here, you know, and then I put them all back to sleep, but that was okay, but... Um, so that will begin next Wednesday night, Wednesday night meal. So we'll get back to our 1 Corinthians, um, I believe we're in chapter number 10. 
We left off at the end of chapter 9, and so between Adam and I, we will get you through that book verse by verse on Wednesday nights, and so we'll get that started back next week. Uh, the last couple of Wednesdays, last Wednesday we had Awana, and the two before that we dealt with the subject of abortion in the Bible and thought that would be appropriate. So we're going to get back to Corinthians, back to our regular midweek uh, kind of series and flow with meals next Wednesday night. And so tonight, I thought I would um, focus on a, a psalm, a favorite psalm of mine. I've taught out of this psalm at different times, and it's Psalm 91. And it's unique because typically when we think of the psalms, um, majority of the time we think he didn't write them all, but we tend to think of David, right? David wrote so many of the psalms, some of the real notable ones. You think of Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, and, and others, but Psalm 91 has the unique uh, position of having been written by Moses. And you don't think of Moses typically when you're thinking of Psalms. Now, Jewish tradition, uh, the Misra, which, you know, it's Jewish tradition, so, you know, I wouldn't sell the farm on it. But they typically viewed Psalm 1, the, the tradition was it was... Uh, composed by Moses at the completion of the tabernacle as he was ascending up Sinai uh, as a protection from the uh, angels of destruction. Now, uh, I don't know where the angels of destruction came into the Bible story, but it, I can see where someone may want to try to connect this to the building of the tabernacle and the completion because the psalm talks about dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. And in the context of the Old Testament before the cross, when you're talking about approaching God and worship in a visible place, man, it takes you to the tabernacle, or later it would take you to the temple. And so there's a sense that this would be centered upon that particular worship. And so we're going to go ahead and read this tonight. Um, after the um, Bible study tonight, we'll go ahead and take prayer requests from the floor. So if you have a prayer request, be thinking about that. We'll come around, we'll receive those, we'll pray together, and we'll have our missions uh, spotlight as well as always. So let's go ahead and begin. I'll begin reading in, in Psalm 91 in verse 1. And it says here, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. Surely he will deliver you from the snare or the trap of the fowler or the hunter, from the noisome or grievous disease, pestilence. He'll cover you with his feathers and under his wings shall you trust. His truth will be your shield and your buckler. You will not be afraid for the terror by night or for the arrow that flies by day nor for the pestilence, the disease that walks in darkness, nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand shall fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, your habitation, there will no evil befall you, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon will you trample under feet. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high. Because he's known my name, he will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, if you pay careful attention to the pronouns in this, you'll see it's kind of the idea of um, man, a fellow traveler on the faith journey encouraging those who are coming behind him. Notice in verse 1 and 2 it says, He that dwells in the secret place um, of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Another place in verse 9 it says, Because you have made the Lord which is my refuge, even the Most High your habitation, no evil will befall you. Well, you have the first place, you have a person that is speaking. Verse 2 says, I will say of the Lord. 
He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and him I will trust. So you got someone here, they're speaking in the first person. And it's a first person testimonial of what God means to this person. It's a person speaking with confidence. It's a person speaking with assurance. And you think about it in the context of understanding the authorship being Moses. It's Moses really speaking about the confidence and the trust that he has in the Lord. But notice the switch of pronoun in verse 3. Verse 3 says, uh, he says, my God in whom I will trust. End of verse 2. And then verse 3, surely he will deliver what? You. And from this place on, from verse 3, from verse 13, it's not I anymore. It's not Moses saying what God means to me. It's him speaking to others about what God can mean to them. So it's this sojourner of faith who's kind of gone down the road ahead. And you know, it's important you have people like that in your life speaking into your life. Because, you know, I've heard it said there's, there's uh, you know, three kinds of people you need to have in your life as a believer. You need to have those mentors who are out in front of you that you're learning from. And then you got those people that, you know, you're kind of hanging out with or where you're at. And then you have those that you're the person that's out in front coming behind you and that you're pouring into. Sadly, so many times I see in the Christian life where people are definitely full with those people that are around them, which is a good thing. But sometimes they do that without that person out in front of them. And they're getting all their wisdom and advice from people who don't know any more than they know, right? <laughs> getting it from my buds that are with me. Um, man, they're just, they're just making it up as they go, just like you are, right? But when you're able to sit there and talk to a Nolan and a Linda Leverett who've been down that road ahead of time, man, they're pouring wisdom. They're pouring the, the years into you. you got to have people like that in your life, you know? Whatever you want to be successful at in life, find someone who's already been successful at it. Go talk to Jim and Lila and Starfer over there. They can tell you kind of where, uh, where the minds are in the minefield, right? They've been around this church so long, they can tell you where the bodies are buried, if there are any. I don't know. But anyway, you know, you got to have people like that in your life. So I say sadly, I see one mistake is it's all people that are like me. And I'm not having the wisdom poured into me that's ahead of me. That's critical. But there's a second mistake that even those make that have that mentoring being poured into them. Man, they want people pouring into them. They love people pouring into them. But you know what? It's kind of like they're not that conduit where they receive this wisdom and grace to do what? To pour and share into others, right? And rather than being a conduit or a living, lively stream, they become kind of a stagnant pool. And it's all coming in, but nothing's going out. It's kind of like the Dead Sea, right? You've heard the joke, why the Dead Sea is called the Dead Sea, because the Dead Sea is what? It's, it's dead. What makes it dead? Well, they call it Dead Sea in a lot of ways. And by the way, at, at surface, it's the lowest elevation on the surface of the earth at surface level is the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea is this kind of basin of water and all that the Jordan River flows into it, which gets its spring head up at um, up in the um, Lebanon mountains. And it all comes in and you have these little tributaries coming in from the smaller hills there around Judea and whatnot and the water comes in but you know what happens when it gets to the Dead Sea it doesn't go anywhere there's nowhere for it to go and it just stagnates in there and the Dead Sea has like one of the highest salt contents of any body of water on the earth and I've not been there but I've seen people where they'll go there and they go out into it and try to push themselves under the water and it just keeps wanting to pop you up like a fishing bobber and why is that because it's so full of mineral because everything's coming in and nothing's going out so I think it's so important that we understand as Christians we need people who are out in front of us we need those people pouring into us and let me just say this to you if you're younger and you say, well, I'll do that when I'm older, you wait too long. There's not a lot left older than you. And you start realizing at some point that you're one of the older ones, you know, and then you're like, wow, where'd it go? So you need people pouring into your life. 
But then you also need to, those people that you're pouring into as well. And I think that's what's going on here. So that Moses says, I'm going to tell you about my God, but this is what he's going to do for you. And the coolest thing in this psalm is when you get to the end of it in verse 14, um, the pronouns change again. And now it's, it's first person again, but now it's not Moses speaking. God himself shows up to talk. And it says in verse 14, because he has set his love upon me, I will deliver him. I will set him on high. Because he's known my name, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. And you got all these eyes of God. So I want to give you an overview. So you got this, this psalm of really of fellowship, this psalm of habitation with God. But it's Moses passing on the wisdom and the experience of his relationship to others. And then God putting a seal of approval on what he's saying and saying these are the promises of that one that's sojourning with me. So some of the greatest words ever written are recorded here for us. And you know, he says here, and I'll begin reading in verse 1, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So the, the idea of this psalm is the secret, uh, it's that dwelling in the secret place. And you know, the most important part of our lives is the part that no one else sees, right? I mean, we all see each other. And so we form our opinions of each other by what we see. But, you know, it's the secret place that's the most important part of my life because that's the part beyond what everyone sees. That's the part that, that God sees. That's the part that's going to be the source of, of my growth and my my spiritual life. And it's dwelling in that secret place. You know, Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, Jesus said, But when you pray, enter into your closet, and when you shut your door, pray to your Father, and he said this, which is where? Your Father which is in secret. And your Father which sees in secret will reward you openly. And so... The many blessings that are promised in this psalm, man, are for those who are living in fellowship with the Lord, living in communion with God and that regular abiding presence. It's to the one who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. And so that's what I want to just kind of encourage you about and look at tonight, just the strength, the importance we gain from that really communion with the Lord in the secret place that really is the strength of the everyday life. It's kind of the root structure of our Christian life. And, you know, most often in life, we're just kind of coasting along and things are going pretty well. But when you get into those challenging, difficult, difficult times of life, that's not the time you want to start planting roots. That's the time you want to start drawing out of those roots. You know, I think many of you have seen um, what's happened in our family this week. My nephew, uh, Joey, Joey was a member of our church, and then he started working for Gulfstream up in uh, Georgia. And yesterday morning, he left for work, and his wife was there early in the morning with the boys. They had a house fire, and uh, their three-year-old was, was killed in the house fire. And his wife, Samantha's burned about 45% of her body, and she's at the burn unit in Augusta, Georgia. And uh, his sister, Larissa, leads in singing a lot of times here. She's one of the younger blonde-haired girls, and she's there. And so Joey's two hours from where they live with Samantha at the hospital. There's some family with the kids. The kids had some smoke inhalation issues, the other three boys. That's not a time to start growing roots, is it? That's a time to draw out of the roots. And I think it's tragic that so often I see people that are waiting. And it's when tragedy strikes and it's when difficulty comes in their life. They want this kind of instant rice Christianity. They want to kind of pop something open and pour some water on it. And it's just going to kind of hydrate in that instant. And they're going to have this wonderful gourmet meal of life it doesn't work that way 
And so, so often what we're really doing when we're sowing into our lives, man, we are sowing into the time to come. And not just the time to come that may be difficult in our own life, but we're really sowing into the time to come when we need to, mean, need to be pouring into the difficulties in someone else's life. I'm so thankful Joey had to go up to Augusta last night. I mean, he was there by himself yesterday with his wife two hours away. And uh, I have a friend in Augusta reached out and said, hey, what's going on? I told him. And he went over. You know what he did? He went over. Good Christian guy. Spent spent. Sat there with Joey until family came. It was so cool knowing someone who was there, you know, and someone who's got some roots that have been planted, that it was nothing for him to drop what he was doing in his life and prioritize the life of someone he didn't even know, but he knew me. He knew he was a brother in Christ. You see, so that's what this is about. That's what our time with God is about. That's what the secret place it's about. It's knowing the Lord because he's worthy, but it's so beneficial to us because it's where the strength of our life comes from. And that's really, I think, what we, we glean from this is, and that's why it's so important that we choose to live in that secret place. And the most important thing about it, we see, first of all, the secret place is the place of God's presence. Um, it says here in the first uh, couple of verses it mentions, um, we'll get to this in a minute, I'm not there yet, but we'll see it mentions four different names of God. But where, so, so it's this psalmist is sitting there and he immediately starts by talking about how he knows God. And he knows God through different facets of God's name. But what is he talking about? He's talking about that place of our, our private time, our our private devotions with the Lord. I was thinking about Psalm 5, wonderful psalm. The psalmist said, David said, Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my meditation. Hearken to the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For unto you I will pray, my voice you will hear in the morning. O Lord, in the morning I will direct my prayer to you and I will look up. For you're not a God that has pleasure in wickedness. So you got this. He says, Lord, you're going to hear my voice in the morning. What's the point of that? The point is he's prioritizing his time with the Lord. He says, you're my God. You're my Lord. Now you come to Psalm 91 and he says, he that dwells in the secret place. And the first name of God we see here, he calls him the most high God. The most high. Now, in English, what's translated most high in Hebrew is the name of God, El Elyon. One of the things I love in, in Scripture is there's so many different names that God gives of himself to reveal himself. Now, it's not different gods. It's one God with different names or, or titles that really show us different facets of who he is. Like, I call Pastor Dave Spencer, I call him David, because I don't want to confuse him with the other Dave, right? Or the other Dave. So, to me, it's Pastor Dave. Savannah, call you, your daughter call you Pastor Dave? Does Jackson, your son, call you Pastor Dave? What do they call you, Dad? Okay, so they call him Dad. Does Melody call you Pastor Dave, your wife? Really? Oh, she calls you Dad, too, no. Yeah, my wife calls me Pastor Mike. We're very formal at our home. Um, probably calls you David. I know she calls you David when she's aggravated. I've heard her say that. Yeah, but, you know, my wife might call me Mike. She call, call me dear, honey, right? Um, you know, maybe someone in here, depending on your uh, occupation. You have a police officer in here. Someone maybe calls you officer. That has to do with your work. You see, names reveal facets of who we are. So with God, there's so many names that are mentioned of him. Now, some liberal theology want to attribute to that saying, well, the Bible's, you know, it's not cohesive and it's thrown together. And depending on the name of God, someone called him, they threw another part together. I'll give you an example. You go back to Genesis chapter one. It says, in the beginning, what? God created. And all the way through chapter one, the name of God, which in English is God, is Elohim. Elohim is the name of God, the triune God. It's actually plural, right? Let us make man in our image. 
So chapter 1, but then you get to chapter 2, and this is later on my notes, this pops out. It says, the Lord God. So chapter 2 of Genesis introduces a new name of God, and that's translated Lord. It's Jehovah, and it mixes it, a compound name, with God, Jehovah Elohim. You say, well, what's the point of that? Well, uh, a more liberal kind of non-Bible-believing approach of Scripture says, well, that's because uh, they had two different authors, and they kind of got piled it all together. It's called the J-E-P-D theory. J is for Jehovah, the Jehovist, that's one writer. E is for the Elohist, right? P is for the priestly class, that's a whole different group. And then you got the Deuteronomists, okay? And so it's just kind of, it's like not having enough spiritual discernment to realize, no, it's not a bunch of different people calling God different things, it's God revealing himself to us. And it's so obvious, I actually heard of one person attacking the Bible because after Adam sinned, and it says in the, the voice of the Lord's walking in the cool of the day, and he asked, he said, Adam, where are you? They said, see, that's not really God. He would have known where Adam was. Like, how can you miss the point? God knew where Adam was. He wanted Adam to know where Adam was, right? So sometimes they just miss the whole, why is that? Because the Bible says the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God because they are foolishness to him. But God is revealing himself to us. And the first name, he says, is, is Most High. The secret place of, the, of El Elyon. Now, what does El Elyon mean? Well, the first time that's revealed in Scripture is in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 9, when Melchizedek the priest came, when Abraham was fighting the battle with the different kings. He said he was the priest of the most high God, and then it defines possessor of heaven and earth. El Elyon is the possessor of heaven and earth. It's the name of God as the ultimate and supreme authority. I like to think in the Great Commission when Jesus says, all power is given unto me. That's in reference to the the revelation of God as El Elyon, the one with all power, the possessor of heaven and earth. So he says, I'm going to dwell in the secret place of the Most High. And then he says, and I, and the one who does that will abide under the shadow of, now notice, Almighty. Capital A, Almighty. You know, when you read the name of God, Almighty, in the scripture, it is a translation of the Hebrew word El Shaddai. El Shaddai. Now, what does El Shaddai mean? It's an interesting name for God because it's the one that's closest to a feminine connotation. It's the one, it's El Shaddai, it's the one who makes fruitful. It's been, it's been described as the breasted one, the one who gives nourishment. And I often think of that because God is revealed in Scripture as a male. They said to Jesus, how do we pray? He said, you pray this way, you pray our Father. That's in heaven and earth. I know we're not going to get through this whole psalm tonight. I got too many side things popping in my head. And Wednesday's a good time to go down some of these trails. So I've often thought, Candace, how... So we got God's the Father. He's a man, right? He's masculine. I'm saying, well, he created a lot of females. Where do they get femininity? There's God the Father, Right? Where do they get that nature? Well, God is revealed in the masculine as man, and and, and he's always referred to as he, and I don't contradict that at all, and the scripture is very clear. But it's cool how one of the names of God is, is that nourishing one. And even Paul, when he talked about discipling, he said, we were among you as a, a nursing mother. It's that sense of that care and that nursing. And, and, and God is so powerful and all-encompassing that through him, man, we get the full revelation of all the features of humanity proceeding from him. There was no one else for it to come from. But El Shaddai, El, uh, El Shaddai, um, when you read the book of Job, which is a book of a lot of suffering, right? A lot of difficulty Job went through. But when you get to the end of Job, he gets double, right? He becomes the fruitful one, fruitful through his suffering. 
Jesus said, except a grain of wheat fall on the ground and die, it abides alone. But when it dies, it breaks open and it bears much fruit. And so much of fruitfulness in life comes out of trial and pain. And that's Job. You know, the number one name used for God throughout the book of Job is Almighty. Almighty, El Shaddai, the breasted one, the nourishing, the one who makes fruitful. He that dwells in the secret place of El Elyon will abide under the shadow of El Shaddai. And then it says, I will say of the Lord. Okay, now you look at the word Lord there in your Bible. You notice all the letters are capital. L-O-R-N-D are all capital. When you see the word Lord in the Bible, in English, where it's all capitalized, that's a translation of the Hebrew word um, Jehovah or Yahweh, depending on how you want to tra- uh, dis- how you want to pronounce it. Jehovah, Yahweh, that's Lord. Now, if you see it with capital L with a small O R D, that's Adonai. That's a whole different name of God, and that's typically translated as, as Master. And so, the thing I'm saying to you is, there's all these names that are just revealing things about God. Now, who's Jehovah? Jehovah's the name for God that says, I am the I am. When he revealed himself as Jehovah, but it's, it's God's covenant name with his people. Genesis 1, you're talking about general creation. It's, it's Elohim. Get to chapter 2 where people are coming into the picture and he starts kind of fleshing out that six-day creation, the creation of man. And it's, it's Jehovah Elohim. It's God's covenant name. Um, one person described it as God. The name uh, Jehovah is he that was, he that is, and he that is to come. So there's Jehovah. And then you got the kind of uh, meat and potatoes name of God, <laughs> Elohim. He says, I will say of the Lord Jehovah, he is my refuge and my fortress my Elohim, my God. And what does he say? In him I will trust. So before he starts passing on encouragement, what does he establish? He establishes firmly the relationship that he has. And he knows God as El Elyon. He knows him as the Almighty. He knows him as Jehovah. He knows him as Elohim. Man, the the psalm writer here, Moses, is talking about what? The blessing of being in that secret place. Why? Because that's the place of his presence. That's where you get to know him and his character and who he is. And so it's the place where we see and we meet with God, right? So what's the value of being in the secret place, that time we spend with the Lord and getting to know him? Um... And that's by application, now by literal doctrinal context in the Old Testament, they'd be talking about meeting God at the place of his presence, which was at the tabernacle. What's the place of God's presence today? It's within every believer, right? Our body, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. So it's the place of God's presence, but then you notice in verse 3 where he starts shifting and it's not no longer about mine, it's about you. Um, You see also, you see it's a place of protection, beginning verse 3. Surely he shall deliver what? You. You from the trap of the hunter, from the terrible disease. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will trust. His truth will be your shield and your buckler. So you see in these verses here where we see God, he's offering protection. And that protection over our enemy's traps. You know, the Bible says that Satan walks about as a roaring, what? Lion, seeking whom he may encourage, right? Nourish, be a blessing. No, seeking whom he may destroy, right? He wants to be, the, he's a devourer. And so that's the description we see here of Satan. Jesus described him in um, John chapter 8. I believe verse 44, he said, the thief, right? He comes not but to what? Steal and kill and destroy. So Jesus describes Satan's purposes as thievery, murder, destruction. And he walks about as a roaring lion seeking. And how does he do that? He doesn't come knocking on your door and say, hello, I'm the devil. I want to introduce myself to you today before I plague your life with damage. 
No, he's going to show up. Man, he's going to be, the Bible says that his messengers can appear as angels of light, right? He, why? Because he is, he's tricky. The Bible says we're not ignorant of his strategy, his devices. Um, talks about his schemes, his wiles, right? So Satan's a deceiver, and he's got traps laid for the believer, um, that believer who ventures outside of God's word, right? When you venture outside of God's word, you venture outside of that authority, you set yourself up, right? You set yourself up to be deceived. And um, so protection against the enemy's tracks. Fearful circumstances. Verse 5. You, you, you will not be afraid of the terror by night or the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence or the disease that walks in darkness nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. And he talks about, and then it says, uh, a thousand will fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. So all those things described there, fearful circumstances that can come into our lives. Um, and, I, and I think kind of, there's, there's a truth in here when really do we become fearful is when we lose sight of the secret place. I knew a wonderful missionary couple, Daryl and Louise Champlin. And uh, man, just kind of heroes of the faith. And Daryl went home to be with Jesus a few years back. Louise is still living, still living down in uh, the jungles of Suriname with her adult children. But I'll never forget something she told me 30 years ago, and it's always stuck with me. She said... Safety is not found in the absence of danger, but in the presence of God. She said, you don't find safety by avoiding danger. You find safety in the presence of God. And so that's that secret place, right? That's that trust. That's that confidence in who he is. Um, as you guys know, for years, I've hate, I hated flying, right? Afraid of flying, man. I get white knuckles scared on airplanes. Take off. Landing and turbulence, man, just, I hated it. My wife would laugh at me, right? We'd, we'd be landing, and I'd be like this, and it hit the ground, and I'd always say, ha, cheated death one more time. And she'd just laugh at me and say, I can't believe you're so afraid of flying. But let us be in a car together downtown somewhere and pull up to a light, and someone standing on the corner, it looked a little shady, and my wife would lock the doors and grab my arm and I'd say, oh, look who's afraid now. And she'd always, she has an answer for everything. She said, I'm not afraid to die at the hands of God. I'm only afraid to die at the hands of man. And I was like, oh. So I had this fear, you know. But you know really what it was is, and I dealt with this for years. I always, I'd still fly, I'd still go. I mean, I'd fly across the Atlantic. I'm flying all over, you know. I'm just nervous the whole time. And I don't know how many years back now, maybe five, six years, I was in uh, Central America in Panama and uh, flew across, you know, Gulf into Panama. I always felt better once we got over the water because in my mind, at least there's a place to land if you're not over the open water. Unless you're on the Hudson River, right, and Scully or Scully's flying, then you're good. But on the way back, I just came to grips with I was really sick of this. I thought, this is ridiculous. I'm a follower of Christ. What in the world? And I really evaluated the whole thing, really took it to a deeper level, and I came to a conclusion. I really was not afraid of flying. What I was afraid of is dying when the plane crashed. And I just worked my way through that, and I, really what I had to deal with was the fear of death. Now, I don't know about you. Maybe you're a Christian. You got saved, and all of a sudden you lost the fear of death. I, I didn't. Didn't think about it all the time, but subconsciously, that's what was there. But that day, I just dealt with it. I thought, you die, you die. You go to be with Jesus, and you know what? That's it. That's what I have not been afraid of flying since that flight. The turbulence, I'm like, wow, this is kind of like being on a bumpy road in a car. And I imagine that. And then I think about the pilots up there are probably really, really good, you know. And I think about, saw a thing on how you can bend the actual wings of a plane and it could withstand all this stuff I'm like this is a this is a good thing to be on I got it all figured out right I got to think it through but you know what we become fearful when we lose sight of the secret place 
when we lose sight of our relationship with the Lord, our trust in Him. So when fear comes, what do we need to do? We need to run to the secret place, into the presence of the Lord. That's what he says. That's the, the blessing of the secret place. And then you have protection over satanic activity. When you look in verse 8, um, only with your eyes will you behold and see the reward of the wicked because you have made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, your habitation. No evil will befall you, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. And look at this. He will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands lest you dash your foot against a stone. Anyone, that verse familiar to anyone any, somewhere else in the Bible? Matthew? What's that? Satan quotes it. Matthew 4 and Luke 4, Jesus is being tempted out in the desert, right? And Satan starts quoting the Bible. Satan quotes the Bible. He quotes the scripture to Jesus. He's trying to tempt him, right? And he's got all this stuff. How did Jesus resist him? With the scripture. First of all, Satan says, command these stones, bread. Jesus says, man will not live by bread alone. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, right? He tells them, uh, you know, fall down and worship me and I'll give you all these kingdoms. Jesus says, no, you should worship the Lord your God. Him only shall you serve. And then Satan says, bring yourself up to the pinnacle of the temple and cast yourself down. Basically, show people your power. And then he quotes this. He'll bear you up. And Jesus quotes scripture back to him and says, well, you should not tempt the Lord your God. You don't tempt God by provoking him to protect you by doing stupid things, right? I'm going to be stupid because I trust God to protect my stupidity. Don't tempt the Lord your God with stupidity. That's not a good thing. He's under no obligation to protect your stupidity. But what was Jesus doing there? He was doing battle with Satan by going where? To the, to the word. Into his father's presence. Into truth, right? He wasn't kind of just, he just... He just went right to the word of God. Right to the word of God. Right to the word of God. You know, James says in James chapter 4, verse 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil. And he'll flee from you. Well, what's... what's it says, before he says, resist the devil, he begins by saying, submit yourself to God. So what is part of how I resist Satan? I know you just scream in Jesus' name, depart from me, you demon of whatever, right? I see a lot of people doing that. I don't know if it's working for them, but I see that. But what's the Bible say? The Bible says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil. So I submit myself to the power of the authority of Christ. And then in verse 8 of chapter 4, James says, draw near to God and he will do what? He'll draw near to you. Draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Resist the devil. Submit yourself to God. Humble yourself, he says, under the mighty hand of the Lord. So, man, you got satanic attack. And you just see here he talks about, you know, the wicked one and, and coming near you and and you've made the Lord, which is your refuge, even the most, your habitation, no evil befall you. So you see this kind of just this blessing of being in the secret place. You know, you got protection. You got the presence of the Lord, knowing him better. And then you come to verse 14, where God begins to speak, as I said, in the first person. And there you see uh, a place where you see God's just starting to lay out his promises. So Moses is saying, here's what I have experienced by dwelling in the secret place with him. This is its benefit to you when you dwell in the secret place of the Most High. And then God steps in and says, here's the promise of that. Because he has set his love upon me. Um, talking about this follower. I will deliver him. I will set him on high. Because he's known my name, he will call upon me. I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him. I will honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and I will show him my salvation. Man, it's just like kind of a machine gun of promises, right? Semi-automatic promise gun there. 
God just starts saying, I'm going to do this, 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 this. And just the promises of God, you know, that we see here. I'll deliver him. I'll set him on high. I'll answer him. I'll be with him in trouble. I'll honor him. I'll satisfy him. I will show him my salvation. Now, the truth of the matter is the promises of God are there whether we're abiding in the secret place or not. But we're not likely to lay hold of them. We're not likely to have confidence in them. Because where's faith come from? Romans 10, 17. Faith comes from what, Brian? Hearing. Hearing what? The word of God, right? So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if I um, am using the Bible as some kind of amulet, right? Or I use the Bible as some kind of, you know, Pull a verse here or there that really makes me feel warm and fuzzy. And I'll even hang it on my wall at home. And we have verses on our wall. So that's a good thing. But if the Bible only becomes to you some kind of a devotional, motivational, kind of feel good in the moment thing. But you're not laying roots into the scripture and understanding the scripture and learning the scripture. You know, you're not going to avail yourself of the depths of its riches. You're not going to be drawing out of those promises. But, you know, when God's word, as Colossians says, is dwelling in us richly. And, man, we are meditating on it. We are giving ourselves the Psalm 1 experience, right? The godly man is, is in the word. He's meditating on it day and night, right? The successful man, Joshua 1, 8, is the one that's, or woman is the one that's in the word. In the word, words in us. And when you have that kind of relationship with the word, man, and it's engrafted, James says, into your soul, literally becomes a part of you. Man, it's just there. It's just there. Man, you get into a pickle and immediately scripture comes to your mind. That's an awesome thing. That's what really I think we're getting here is is God's showing these promises, not because the promises don't exist even when we're not dwelling, but we're not very likely to be aware of them. We're not very likely to draw out of them. So the blessing and the benefit of the secret place and in the word of God and our relationship with him and our walk with him is, man, it's just just right there. It's right there. You know, in uh, Romans chapter 10, it's talking about faith and it quotes a um, scripture out of Deuteronomy and it says the word is near you, even in your lips. It's like the word of God for a believer is not up in heaven and I got to go up there and find it or it's not in the depths and I got to kind of get into some submarine and go down. He said, no, the word's near you. It's, it's in that relationship with Christ. So he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High um, is going to abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And when we make his place our refuge, our habitation, And think of a habitation as this. A habitation is a place I make a habit of being at, right? So when I make a habit of being in his word, being with the Lord, man, I I draw out the blessing of this. And this is a wonderful, wonderful psalm that, man, is, is, it's there for you. It's there for you. It's concrete. It's what we need in our life. Amen. Pastor Dave, you going to come and lead the prayer time? I left you a minute or two. No, I got, you got plenty of.